like to return from recess. Thank you uh, for resetting, for waiting. I assume most of y'all were in the earlier panel as well and got a chance to enjoy some of the conversation that was occurring. Uh, I'd like to go ahead and pursue to all committee rules to swear in the witnesses before they testify. Would you please stand, raise your right hand. Thank you. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give to this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, no and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you. Let the, uh, you may be seated. Let the record reflect the witnesses all answered in the affirmative. In the second panel, we have uh, Ms. Evelyn Klimstein, the Assistant Inspector General for the Department of State. Thank you for being here. Ambassador Kenneth Morefield, the Deputy Inspector General for the Department of Defense. Ms. Linda Dixon, the Program Manager for Combating Trafficking in Persons Office for the Department of Defense. And Mr. Mike Howard is the Chief Operations Officer for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. Um, and I am grateful that you are here and looking forward to being able to receive your testimony and be able to hear what is going on. Obviously, your written testimony has already been uh, submitted. That will be part of the record. I would be honored to be able to receive oral testimony at this point. Ms. Klimstein. Thank you, Chairman Langford, Ranking Member Conley, and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to discuss our Office's oversight of the Department's compliance with the Federal Acquisition Regulations FAR Trafficking in Persons Clause. OIG has actively conducted TIP oversight to include making it an area of emphasis for audits, inspections, and evaluations. Specifically, the objective of our October 2011 audit on the Bureau of East Asian and Pacific Affairs, EAP, was to measure the extent to which Department personnel and contractors we are complying with laws, regulations, and policies established to prevent and detect TIP activities on Department awarded contracts. While the audit did not find evidence of any form of TIP involving contractor employees or contractors, the Department must strengthen implementation of its zero tolerance policy regarding TIP. We found that Department employees in the Asia Pacific region we are not uniformly aware of what constitutes TIP activity, the penalties for TIP violations, where to report suspected violations, and whether the TIP policy applies to Department contractors. A general awareness survey was distributed to employees in the Asia-Pacific region to assess whether the employees were aware of TIP issues. 1,702 Department employees responded to the survey which disclosed that 46 percent of the Department employees either were somewhat aware or not at all aware of the zero tolerance policy. Forty-three percent of the employees did not know where to report suspected violations, and 79 percent of the employees had not received training about TIP. We also found that contractors in the region were not always aware of or complied with their obligations under the FAR clause. We visited 24 contractors whose contracts included the FAR clause and found that 83 percent had not notified their employees of the TIP uh, policy and 92 had not informed their employees of the consequences of violating that policy. Additionally, six contractors hired subcontractors to perform services. However, no contractors had included the required FAR clause in their subcontracting agreement. We found that Department contracting officials did not consistently include the FAR clauses in contracts. Of 41 contracts reviewed in the region, we found that 27 percent of them did not contain the clause, and eight contracts did not contain the correct version of the clause. Further, even when the clause was contained in contracts, Department contracting officials did not monitor contractor compliance with the clause. Inspectors also found that an embassy contract did not always include the FAR clause. In FY 2010, inspectors reviewed contracts at 20 posts and found that 25 percent of them had contracts without the required clause. In FY 2011, teams addressed the same issue at 16 posts and found that 19 percent of them had contracts without the required clause. When inspectors found contracts that did not include the FAR clause, Embassy staff immediately began the process of modifying the contract. During the October 2011 audit, the Department issued a Procurement Information Bulletin, or a PIB, on combating trafficking in persons, which requires contracting officers to ensure that all solicitations and contracts over the micro-purchase threshold of $3,000 contain the TIP clause. The PIP also provides guidance to contracting officer representatives, or CORs, on how to monitor TIP compliance. 
We expect the new guidance will enhance the Department process for monitoring contractors for TIP compliance. We recommended that the Department implement a policy in the Foreign Affairs Manual on TIP, expand the Department's conduct, a code of conduct to prohibit TIP activities, and designate an office to which employees and contractors should report suspected violations. In addition, the Department should expand its TIP training to all Department employees. In response to the audit, the Ambassador at Large for the Office to Monitor and Combat Trafficking in Persons stated that his office found the report helpful, if somewhat troubling, and there was undoubtedly a need for increased awareness and understanding of human trafficking in the State Department. The Ambassador generally agreed with all the report's recommendation and stated he was taking corrective actions. OIG also released an evaluation in January 2011 of six contracts in Arab states of the Gulf which assessed the risk of TIP-related activities. Although we found no direct evidence that contractors violated provisions of the FAR clause, we found indicators that increased the likelihood that a TIP violation could occur. Specifically, our team found that 77 percent of contract employees interviewed had to pay fees up front during recruitment which could indicate an increased risk of debt bondage, and that every contractor reviewed confiscated workers' passports. In addition, contract workers at all posts expressed frustration and inconsistent, with inconsistent payments, confusing pay stubs, and withheld wages. More than 70 percent of the workers interviewed also reported that they lived in overcrowded, unsafe, or unsanitary conditions. TIP monitoring was ineffective because COR did not have standard procedures to monitor the inflation of FAR. We recommended that POST strengthen TIP monitoring procedures and the Department provide detailed guidance on how to monitor contractors' practices. Negative contracting practices can affect foreign workers and reflect poorly on the United States. We believe that adopting a strong TIP program while, which includes mechanisms to increase employee awareness, report suspected type violations, and provide for a strong monitoring program of contractors, will help TIP and ensure that foreign workers are treated fairly and within the law. Once again, thank you for the opportunity to present our work on this important topic. I am pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Ambassador Moorfield. Yeah, can you get your mic? Yeah, thank you. My voice isn't carrying that well today. Good morning, uh, members of the committee, Chairman Lankford and uh, Ranking Member Connolly and uh, distinguished members of this uh, committee. I want to thank you for the opportunity today to uh, discuss our oversight uh, reporting at the Department of Defense Inspector General's Office uh, with respect to trafficking in persons. I have also presented a uh, written statement which I ask be submitted for the record. The DODIG uh, previously presented testimony on oversight uh, efforts concerning the topic of human trafficking uh, in 2004 and again in 2006. Our first assessment was uh, initiated in response to a request from members of the Congress to the Secretary of Defense asking for an investigation into allegations concerning uh, the U.S. military leadership in South Korea and whether or not they had been implicitly condoning sex slavery in that country. In addition to that project, uh, DOD uh, IG initiated another parallel assessment into allegations that the European Command activities in Bosnia, Herzegovina, and Kosovo also uh, had similar problems. In addition to the command actions uh, taken in response to our reports to prohibit and prevent sex slavery in these two environments, uh, both assessments recommended strongly that the Secretary of Defense issue a policy statement that clearly and unambiguously set forth DOD opposition to any activities promoting, supporting, or sanctioning human trafficking, and the Department subsequently did that. Further, DOD established annual CTIP awareness training in 2004 for all service members and DOD civilians, which continues till today. In a follow-up uh, initiative, the DOD IG initiated an evaluation of CTIP efforts across all of DOD in 2005. The resulting report recommended that the Office of the Secretary of Defense develop CTIP policy and program guidance, and in response, the Department issued DOD instruction combating, instruction, uh, combating trafficking in persons that assigned CTIP program responsibilities across the Department. 
Our most recent efforts uh, were conducted as a result of the William Wilberforce Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act of 2008. Uh, this act, uh, as you know, requires State Department, uh, USAID, and DODIGs to each report uh, each year in January uh, for three consecutive years beginning in January 2010 on a sample of contracts or subcontracts under which there is a heightened risk that a contractor may engage knowingly or unknowingly in acts related to trafficking in persons. To accomplish this, uh, the DOD IG has consulted each year with the State Department's office to monitor and combat trafficking in persons, as well as the DOD CTIP program office. Uh, we selected four combatant commands to conduct these reviews, the U.S. Pacific, Central European, and Africa commands. Uh, to date, we've issued two of these reports covering the Pacific and Central commands, and the report on European and Africa commands will be issued in January 2012. In the U.S. Pacific Command uh, overview, we found the Federal Acquisition Regulation, the FAR Clause, combating trafficking persons present in 93 percent of the contracts. Uh, the, the DODIG recommended in its final report that the Director Defense Procurement Acquisition Policy modify contract writing software to ensure that the FAR CTIP clause was automatically included in all contracts, and this was accomplished. <clears throat> In the U.S. Central Command, we found the CTIP clause present in 79 percent of the contracts reviewed. Uh, the team did identify good practices that had been taken by several U.S. contracting commands in Kuwait who had incorporated CTIP compliance items in their quality assurance reviews. Uh, the team found, however, that contracting offices in none of the commands had ready access to TIP violation information from DOD criminal investigative organizations. Providing timely communication of TIP-related indictment and conviction information to DOD contracting organizations remains a systemic challenge. For each reporting year of our investigations in the last two-plus years, the teams have received DOD criminal investigative data on possible TIP violations. Two TIP incidents have been reported so far. In both cases, the contractor had dismissed the offending employees and there was no further judicial uh, investigation taken or certainly judicial action. Uh, during our DOD field work, uh, we have noted that non-appropriated funds were not required to include the FAR CTIP clause in their contracts. As a consequence, the Army and Air Force Exchange Service and Navy Exchange were included in assessments of our U.S. Uh, Central Command, European and Africa commands. And in December 2010, the Navy Exchange Command Headquarters recommended changes inserted in DOD instruction non-appropriated fund procurement procedure, which required inclusion of a CTIP clause in all non-appropriated fund contracts. And as of October, as of this month, that instruction revision process is still ongoing. I also want to report that the DODIG has self-initiated an assessment of CTIP program compliance and performance among DOD components. So far, over 70 DOD organizations have been reviewed, and this report will also be issued in January 2012. Finally, let me emphasize that the DOD Inspector General remains committed to providing oversight support of the U.S. government's zero-tolerance policy against trafficking in persons. We will continue to evaluate DOD CTIP performance and compliance. On behalf of DOD IG, I thank you again for this opportunity to testify. Thank you. Ms. Dixon. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Conley, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for this opportunity to discuss past and ongoing DOD efforts to combat trafficking in persons. The Department of Defense Trafficking in Persons TIP program was designed to ensure that our military services, combatant commands, and defense agencies have the necessary tools to stop it. Training is mandatory for all employees and is mandated by DOD instruction, first published in February 2007 and revised September 15, 2010. The instruction is directive in nature and established policies and assigns responsibilities for combating trafficking. 
The policy recognizes DOD's opposition to trafficking in persons, prostitution, forced labor, and any related activities that may contribute to the phenomenon of TIP. Engaging in trafficking in person is incompatible with DOD core values. To help enforce the policy, heads of DOD components must designate a component combating trafficking in persons CTIP office of primary responsibility, and they must assign a program officer. We maintain a list of all the component points of contact within our office. We maintain this list and we also provide this information to our DODIG when they conduct their periodic evaluations of the DOD CTIP program. DOD started training on TIP using a multimedia uh, combat uh, trafficking in persons program in January of 2005. Our training consists of general awareness training, law enforcement training, and training for our leadership. As well, we also have PowerPoint presentations for our training. Our general awareness training is now available on mobile devices. An annual DOD CTIP conference has been held ever since 2007. A CTIP workshop was held in August of 2011. Best practices among our components are shared and we receive information from the U.S. government agencies as well as from non-governmental organizations at our conferences and workshops. Our DOD CTIP website, ctip.defense.gov, displays information regarding our trafficking in persons training, events, and leaks, links to other agencies' TIP websites. In response to early concerns about possible labor trafficking and subcontracts in Iraq, DOD took swift action. The first TIP clause was in the Defense Federal Acquisition Regulation Supplement DFAR as an interim rule and was published in the Federal Register in October of 2006. The clause required contractors to establish an awareness program to inform employees regarding trafficking in persons. The Federal Acquisition Regulation published a TIP clause in 2009 that required the contractor to notify its employees of U.S. government's zero tolerance policy and to take appropriate action against employees of subcontractors that violated the policy. It did not require contractors to establish an awareness program for their employees. When the FAR rule was published, the DFAR rule clause moved to become program guidance for our contractors regarding the DOD's zero tolerance policy and CTIP training program. A, need, a new DFAR's requirement soon to be published in the Federal Register adds additional contract administration duties to maintain surveillance over contractor compliance with trafficking in persons for all DOD contracts. In December 2010, the Defense Incident Based Reporting System, DIBERS, was updated with the new FBI TIP offense codes commercial sex acts, involuntary servitude, and prostitution offense. Allowing the reporting of TIP offenses by our DOD law enforcement agencies. Human Trafficking Public Service Announcements, or PSAs, 230 seconds and 215 seconds, aired on our Armed Forces Network from October 2009 to October 2010. DOD released four new PSAs in September of 2011 that were aired for five years. Trafficking in persons is a form of modern day slavery and DOD would do our part to strive for its total abolition. Thank you again for scheduling this hearing and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Mr. Howard. Mr. Chairman and the members of the subcommittee, again, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm looking forward to sharing the measures taken by the Army Air Force Exchange Service to prevent human trafficking in the Southwest Asia. APHIS is a joint military activity providing merchandise and services to active duty, reserve, National Guard, and, and their families worldwide. 
AFE is responsible for 3,100 facilities worldwide in 30 countries, 5 U.S. territories, and 50 United States. Uh, we have 43,000 employees. 30 percent of those are family members of the, the military active duty. Another 1 percent are military members on their part-time working after duty hours. We take great pride in our employee relations no matter where they serve. Combating human trafficking is a complex and challenging mission. The responsibility is substantial, but a policy is clear, zero tolerance. My report today will confirm that APHIS is implementing and enforcing a comprehensive combat human trafficking program throughout our contingency area of operations. APHIS runs exchange facilities in eight countries, spread over 71 locations in combat zones in the United Central Command area responsibility. The core of the APHIS team consists of 300 direct hired associates. However, we have over 3,100 individuals that are third country nationals that are hired to provide additional services to the, the military. Uh, these manpower agency concessions are often third country nationals with, and they are an integral part of our team. In fact, without third country nationals, we would not be able to provide world class support to our deployed troops and customers. Today I would like to highlight three essential elements in APHIS's fight against human trafficking, an enforceable bill of rights for third country national associates, consistent inspection and reporting to ensure compliance, and effective communication to increase awareness of command and, and workers and uh, planning for the future also. APHIS has an inherent responsibility and contractual right to ensure humane treatment of third country national working in our facilities. The first element is deterring human trafficking among the third country national population is an enforceable Bill of Rights. In 2008, APHIS developed the Bill of Rights, which con contains non-negotiable aspects of working for the exchange, the right to elevate complaints without fear of appraisal, to have a copy of the contract under which they are employed, to receive pay in a timely fashion, to leave their deployed location at any time. These are among the inalienable rights that each of the third country national workers working with the Manpower Agency has to have. One of the most important of these rights is the freedom to maintain possession of their passport. The Bill of Rights is very clear. At no time with any official, either a contractor or APHIS, will hold, withhold a, p a passport of a third country national worker. This Bill of Rights is part of every manpower agency and concession contract we have, which ensures APHIS has the legal authority to enforce it. The second component of the APHIS program is frequent inspection and mandatory reporting to enforce the Bill of Rights, especially the right to maintain the passports. APHIS leaders ensure manpower agencies and concessionaire contractors do not withhold passports of third country nationals working on our facilities. As a part of the policy, APHIS team leaders, our service business managers, food business managers, and other direct hire APHIS associates in leadership positions are required to conduct 100 percent inspections every month to ensure that the third country nationals of manpower agencies and concession contracts are in possession of their own passports. Leaders report results of the monthly passport verification inspection through the chain of command to the APHIS Regional Operations Center and the contracting officer and representatives documenting any contractor employees that do not or cannot present their passports. APHIS has a zero tolerance of violation of this policy. Corrective action of contractors may include a warning letter or a cure notice, as we call it, which gives the contractor the opportunity to address and rectify the issue termination for default and or referral to criminal or civil authorities for enforcement. Finally, effective communication and command level oversight is the heart of the APHIS combating human trafficking program. To make certain APHIS managers and third country nationals understand com combating human trafficking policies and procedures, the APHIS Bill of Rights posted in the prominent areas in their workplaces have been translated into 11 languages. The APHIS Inspector General conducts sensing sessions with third country nationals to collect independent feedback about the program and our education efforts. Metrics from the combating, combating Human Trafficking Program are incorporated into APHIS's Balanced Scorecard Management Program. The scorecard information regarding passport inspections, proper living conditions, communication efforts, and fair pay are measured and provided APHIS leadership to ensure the program is implemented and enforced throughout the contingency area and to identify areas for improvement. I am pleased to say that the APHIS efforts to condemn and combat this serious crime have been successful. Now completing our third year of the program, APHIS has achieved these following results. Because of our efforts, third country national workers are now in possession of their own passports, several have been liberated from involuntary servitude and been able to return to their own home country as a direct result of this program. 
Davis Contracting Officer Representative McQuaid in Qatar and UAE was cited in January 2011 by the DOD Inspector General for outstanding work in combating human trafficking. In January 2011 report, the DOD IG inspection cited Davis as an ex excellent example of combating trafficking and person awareness and contract quality assurance that merits being considered for replication. Regardless of our significant achievements, human trafficking still exists, and APHIS must and will remain vigilant in these efforts to combat it. We recognize the threat to basic human rights and the zero tolerance for it. APHIS does not, does not have the power to eradicate this scourge throughout the Southwest Asia. We do have the power to fight it to their best ability so that our contract workers are not victimized. We make it clear to our contractors, if you want to do business with APHIS, then you will not engage in human trafficking. APHIS does not have police powers. We cannot enforce contractors to do anything. What APHIS does have is power of contracting, which in many ways is more powerful than police authorities. The ability to make the take the contract away for violation of our policy is very persuasive. Our contractors respond quickly. We might not be able to change the world, but we can and we do combat human trafficking. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you for all your testimony. Let me, let me say first, you will find in members of Congress and those that are included, they can all speak for themselves as well. There is tremendous honor and respect for the work that is done by DOD and the State Department. We are Federal employees as well. We get it. You are also, I am sure when you got out of bed today, said, I can't wait to go do a congressional hearing on this, that you also understand you are getting the full heat for what is really happening beyond you. We understand that as well. My goal with this hearing today, though, is to find ways to get this to stop. Are any of you ready to go on record right now and to say there is no one in State Department or in DOD, that there are currently no one that is being trafficked right now? We know this reality is out there, whether it be one or whether it be 10,000. And it is working through the process to try to work through. We have 19 or 20, as Mr. Connolly had mentioned before, policies and procedures that are major pieces that are there. You have all kinds of process pieces that are in place. The issue in our conversation today is how do we move from these things are in place to this has gone away? We now have the things in line on that. So I want this to be a dialogue today as we go through these questions. So let me, let me just field some questions and go through some things. Mr. Howard, you had mentioned you have the power of contracting and of making those decisions of if a contractor is out of bounds, <clears throat> not doing contracts with them anymore. How often does that occur? Uh, Chairman Langford, we have uh, done six cure letters. Uh, the majority of these were for withholding passports and the contracting, the management agency did the corrective action. There was no more disciplinary action after that. Uh, but it does, when we do that cure letter, is the first step in, in towards termination. If they did not adhere we, to that, the second one would be. Okay. Any others beyond just the passport issue on that? No, it is just the, the passport, the withholding okay. the passport. The, the reason I say that is I have talked to some military personnel coming back as well and saying that that is a standard. If you work inside the wire, you have got to have your paperwork with you. You have got to have the designation on you. You have got to paperwork. They need to know who is walking around. Yes. And so that is not only just obviously your requirement, that is if you are going to be on a base, especially that is their requirement as right. well. What, what about the next step of the issue of the recruiting fees and the broker fees? Because that is where this begins. Uh, if someone is recruited, and they are going to work for the State Department or the Department of Defense, even secondarily through AFES or whatever it may be, and they are coming through the process. Do we have verification from them or anyone have, is holding a conversation with that person uh, that is now working on one of our bases or one of our embassies? How much did you pay to get this job? I cannot say that for the record. Uh, uh, the discussions there, we do ensure they have the contract. We do ensure that the uh, their fair pay is, is in document the contract, but as far as the prior to that, the, the fees and so forth, I'm not aware I could check back on that, take it for the record. Okay. Because that, that's where obviously this begins. Right. Do we have any kind of tracking in place that a subcontractor that's doing recruit that has the recruiting responsibilities, uh, that they are uh, doing a contract with them that we can see it's coming from their home country that shows how much they paid in recruiter fees? Any is any of that in the in the chain at all? I will have to check with our procurement to make sure and we can take that point for the record. Okay. Uh, the effective communication part of that, obviously that becomes a big issue. Posting something, translating into languages, that is a good start. But if they are fired for talking to American leadership, 
or an investigation begins and suddenly that person disappears. Uh, or as I have had conversations with military personnel that have said that there, some of these uh, bosses will just release a person for the slightest thing in their encounters with American personnel. Uh, this person, let's say, paid a $5,000 fee to be able to come, which they took out a loan for. They get there, they work for three months, they find out this terrible, talk to an American and say that this is a problem, then they are gone. Now they have lost their $5,000, they work three months as a slave in horrible conditions, and they are out before the reporting occurs. It is the tracking of all of that. Do you have a sense that any of that may be occurring? Well, we ensure that they get their monthly pay. We also ensure that uh, they are aware of the contract. Our contracting offers a representative in country uh, visits at sites regularly and talks to the associates and has a real good working relationship with the third country nationals and, and uh, I believe has a very good back and forth flow of information. So if there what is any issues of that, it would have been brought to our attention and she had no recollection of that. Okay. It, it just a it's a struggle when we hear so many stories that we have a zero tolerance policy. Yet these stories continue to rise up still, and we're we're still seeing this as a as a practice of whatever scale that that may be. And I know we can all have different numbers of what scale this may occur, um, but it is difficult for me to say. We, we've had these letters that have gone out dealing with passports, but we're not dealing with recruiter fees. We're not dealing with housing issues, for instance. And you know, are they in the 50 square feet required uh, of housing? You know, just the basics of, of how we care for people that are caring for us. It's Chairman Lang we, we stress also the living conditions that uh, if our own APHIS associates are in, in trailers, uh, our third country nationals will be in trailers. If we are in tents, then uh, same thing, whatever the military is in, we have that same living standard for our own associates as well as our third country nationals. Okay. Ms. Dixon, let me ask, who is responsible for assuring that these contracts are fulfilled? Um, let, let, let me just give you an example. Uh, someone that is a, um, uh, on the ground um, uh, that begins to get reports that they have uh, recruiter fees, that their living conditions are not good, they are being mistreated, uh, whether it is sexual abuse or whatever it may be, who begins to follow through the process of, of assuring that the contractor is identified that we don't have a continuing pattern of this occurring? Does that make sense? Uh don't want to step out on uh, not sure, but I believe it should be the contracting officer and contracting officer representative that monitor the contract. Okay. Those, those people should be the ones responsible. Do they have adequate conversation time with the people that are on the ground, these third country nationals? I can't really speak to that. I will definitely take that for the record, too. Well, that, that becomes the challenge of the person that is responsible for overseeing and is not interacting actually with the third country nationals to see if that is actually being fulfilled as promised. Um, then we have a breakdown in that as well. Uh, and, and I'm confident, you know, in the AFES area and other areas, these American companies that are there representing, whether it be fast food or product or whatever it may be, I'm sure they would be mortified to know that some of the employees of their country of their company, I should say, in other countries working for American soldiers have the possibility of being indentured, indentured servitude. I'm, I'm confident none of those American companies would want that to be able to get out or would want to be able to see it as a value, nor would we as American citizens and taxpayers want to know that any of our tax dollars or our uh, process of dealing with our own soldiers and uh, the folks that are service members on that. Uh, there will be plenty of questions. We'll have several rounds to get a chance to talk through, and we'll have this ongoing conversation on that. I'd like to be able to uh, recognize Mr. Conley for six minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I could just pick up on that last point. Ms. Dixon, I'm not sure I understood your answer to the Chairman's question. You said you'd have to get back to us on the record. Your title is Combating Trafficking and Persons Program Manager. Do you get out in the field? Do you meet with contractors and subcontractors to satisfy yourself that this practice is not as widespread as testimony indicated? Yes, I do go out and talk to contracting officers. I have been invited to come and do out I try to do outreach training. To have you been to Iraq? N no, I have not. I have not been to Iraq. And you are you are the program manager for combating trafficking in persons. Correct. I rely on our inspector generals in country as well. Ms. as Ms. Dixon, we've just heard testimony that this is a widespread problem. We're talking about human beings who are being forcibly recruited and, uh, and lured into employment on our behalf 
and you have not made it your business to go and kick the tires and check the dipstick to ascertain to your own satisfaction that these reports are accurate? No, I have not. Do you think it might be your responsibility to do that? Definitely. Thank you. Ambassador Moore, Moore, uh, Moorefield, I placed in the record this statistic that not a single prosecution with respect to uh, this kind of human trafficking has yet been brought by the Department of Defense against any contractor or subcontractor. And again, you heard the testimony in the first panel, unless you wish to contradict it, it is widespread. We are not talking about isolated examples. We are talking about tens of thousands, if not multiples of that. Help me understand, help this committee understand why not a single prosecution has been brought on this subject. Uh, it is a fair question, uh, Congressman Connolly. I only know of one case that uh, was referred uh, to the Department of Justice and they disinclined to pursue it uh, for lack of substantiating evidence. But um, well, let me, let me, I have got limited time, I am sorry, right. Mr. Ambassador, yeah. but do you have any reason to dispute the testimony we heard from the previous panel that this is a widespread problem involving tens of thousands, if not as many as hundreds of thousands of individuals? Uh, I can't verify or deny the number of persons okay. that may be affected. If, if we posit that that is even remotely accurate, mm -hmm. the fact that we have five cure letters, no prosecution, and one reference to the Justice Department they declined to prosecute might suggest to a layman, if not a member of Congress, that we are not taking the subject seriously at all. Well, I, I, uh, I can only say that uh, with respect to the, the justice process and the criminal investigative process that, um, and, you know, I am not trying to avoid your question. You know, we are not di directly responsible. I can consult with our investigative agency to find out what their belief is and get back to you as to why more cases have not been uh, investigated to the point of being referred to the Justice Department for prosecution. Like none? Uh, one referred, none prosecuted that I know of. One. Yeah. How many how many subcontractors are there just to pick one country, Iraq? How many would you guess? I'm sure there are dozens and dozens. Dozens? Mm -hmm. Perhaps many more than that. Well, uh, we've been scaling down, so I, I can't really say what it is today. Uh, it was at one point, no doubt, hundreds. Okay. Ms. Clemston, um, you heard Mr. McMahon in the previous uh, panel indicate that he had written with some suggestions about how the State Department might help deter this phenomenon with its contractors and subcontractors. And he wrote that letter 15 months ago and has yet to receive a reply. Can you explain why? No, I no. Are you aware of the letter? No, I am not aware of the letter. May I ask you, Mr. Chairman, with your indulgence, that uh, we would like you to get back to the committee yes. with an explanation and with a response to Mr. McMahon that is CC'd this committee? Without objection. We are glad committee. to do. I thank the Chair. Um, in your testimony, Ms. Clemstein, uh, you, if I understood you correctly, you said uh, that human trafficking among State Department subcontractors apparently is fairly commonplace, particularly the fact that 77 percent of contract employees paid a recruitment fee, which ought to be a red flag. Doesn't necessarily prove there's human trafficking, but it's one red flag out there, uh, and that passports confiscated and wages were stolen. And you also, do, you also testified to the fact that the awareness level, even among State Department employees, was frankly not where we wanted to be, nowhere near where we wanted to be. Um, is State Department taking this issue seriously? I believe so, in reference to the response that we just received on our October report. I would say that prior to the October report, although our Department had on several instances uh, disclosed potential TIP violations, the seriousness wasn't taken. However, recently, and I think a lot of it had to do with the survey that was actually sent out to employees that substantiated the fact that there was an awareness problem, really did bring the uh, GTIP office to say, yeah, we've got a problem now. We've got to do something. My time is up, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I do have a series of questions for Mr. Howard that I will revisit in the other round. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wahlberg. Is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Howard, uh, in your testimony, 
You stated that because of your efforts, several third country national workers have been liberated from involuntary servitude. Uh, in these cases, what actions were taken uh, against the contractors? That is where the, the cure letters went into, into play and uh, the, the third country nationals were returned to their country and the cure letters to ensure that did not occur again was done with the contractors. There was no termination uh, for default or suspension or debarment in the cases of no. these contractors? No. Um, how many contractors are you aware of that have engaged in these types of abuses? I don't have the exact figures. I have to take one for the record and get back to the committee. I well, appreciate that. Uh, it, it, it appears uh, you were here uh, with the last uh, uh, panel, and it was indicated that while there were um, hundreds and hundreds of allegations and there are incidences of contractor, alleged contractor abuse, there were uh, nationals that were sent back, um, that there were allegations made, yet it was indicated that generally speaking, overwhelmingly speaking, um, Department of Defense, uh, other governmental entities did not question the victims. Do you agree with that or do you reject that as being hyperbole? If we have the opportunity to question the, the individuals before they leave country, we do. Uh, but once they are out of country, we don't have the capability to. So what you are indicating is that, generally speaking, they are out of country before you find out any of the abuse has taken place? Well, again, if there, if there would be abuses, our contract offers representative who is talking to them all the time, our store managers, our general managers that are at each location every day, uh, if they are aware of anything, they would take the appropriate action and contact our Inspector General also. So I am not aware of any. Ms. Dixon, what is, what is your policy on that? I mean, do you agree with the statements made earlier by the panel that um, very few, if any, of the victims were, were interviewed by the Department of Defense? I can't speak to whether victims were interviewed or not. Um, I know that attempts were made to interview victims, whether they, I mean, they tried to get in touch with victims to interview them. Ambassador so Moorfield, how do you respond? Frankly, I'm not aware from any of our, uh, of our oversight initiatives so far that uh, we have determine whether or not uh, they are systematically the prime contractor or is determining whether or not people were, uh, their CTIP rights were violated before they left the country. Uh, we have been uh, accompanying Defense Contract Management Agency and contracting officers on uh, visits to uh, camps where the laborers are kept or in their places of employment uh, where interviews were conducted uh, asking these sorts of questions. Uh, so far, we have not uh, determined that there was a uh, identifiable CTIP uh, violation. Well, I, uh, I, I certainly would appreciate uh, hearing subsequent uh, um, information that the Department of Defense and others are interviewing more of the alleged victims, that we are uh, seeing some aggressive action taking there because it seems like the evidence is leaving the scene and we are not uh, gaining. Uh, the opportunity to find ways of achieving success in this area. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, give my remaining time to the Chairman. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, let, me, let me just ask a quick question, then we are going to uh, continue to move on. <clears throat> the State, State Department report that came out, the OIG report, January 2011 of this year, here is the statement that comes out of it. Seventy-seven percent of the interviewed workers say they obtained their jobs by paying a recruitment agency in their country of origin. Of the 77 percent, approximately 50 percent of those workers said they paid a recruitment fees that totaled more than six months' contracted salary. Twenty-seven percent reported paying fees of more than one year's salary, and 11 of the 75 workers paid a recruitment fee that would take two years to pay off. Okay. They paid a recruiter fee 
two years. That is the length of their typical contract. When it listed out and, and broke out of those that were interviewed, uh, the minimum and maximum of the average payment here, an average person coming in from Bangladesh, $2,383 for a recruiting fee. <clears throat> Here is my struggle. We have got to move past. They have their passport. They could leave if they want to. They don't have the money to leave. They are in indentured servitude, in debt bondage to a recruiter that came, and I am not sure we are verifying that. We have got to be able to move past that. With that, I would like to be able to yield to uh, Ms. Spears for six minutes for questioning time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you all for participating. Let me ask this simple question. Is there a problem in your mind, Ms. Clemenstein? Yes. Mr. Uh, Ambassador Moorfield? Yes. Ms. Dixon? Yes. Mr. Howard? Yes. What tools do you not have? that you need in order to make this problem go away? Well, I think in the State Department there is really three answers to that question. I think, first of all, there needs to be better awareness within the Department. Secondary of all, the contracting officer representatives need to be far more proactive in this area than they have in the past. And as you probably know, the State Department has suffered in the area of CORs on many of its contractor contracts. And that is one of the reasons why our office, the IG office, has been actively working with the State Department to increase CORs with, within the whole region. That has been a huge issue. The third area that I think would definitely help in this uh, arena is to establish some type of hotline, uh, a place where people can call if they feel that they are victims of human trafficking. Um, right now, something like that doesn't exist. And I think that we need you, just like we have in the OIGs, a hotline that for people to call in things to, throughout the department. I think we need one also on the contractor level so that people that are working in these conditions can actually report it. And it would give us, on the investigative side, some mechanism by which to go back and to really dig into these issues. All right. Ambassador Moorfield. What tools do you need? How, I, excuse me, Ms. Clemstein, how many people do you have working specifically on this issue? On this issue, uh, I have had two teams working on it. I am divided into two sections. I have those. Just give me a number. Um, probably about 10 people. 10 people. How about you, Ambassador? How many people are working on this issue? I would say, uh, in the various teams we have sent out or are sending out, about 10. Ms. Dixon, how many in your office? It is only two people in my office. However, we work. Is that including you? Yes, it is. All right, Mr. Howard. We have 300 because all of our APHIS associates are directly involved in monitoring and being aware of what's going on, in addition to our oversight from our European headquarters and our head headquarters in Dallas, Texas. Have you all read the New Yorker piece? Yes. 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 Have you taken any action based on the New Yorker piece? Yes. What action have you taken? You sent a cure letter? I, I answered yes. <laughs> oh, Ms. Dixon. What have you done? Uh, contacted the DODIG uh, about further inquiries into the matter, looked at the previous inspection that was done, the evaluation that was done, um, and looked at the uh, issues that were sent down on that previous inquiry, which was different from what was put out in the New Yorker. Okay. You know, I've got to tell you, I'm as frustrated as my colleagues are on this um, panel. First of all, Ms. Clemstein, I've just been informed that there is a hotline, no one answers it, and that third country nationals don't speak English. I'm not sure what hotline they're referring to, because as far as I know, and based on the audit work that we have done, there has not been a hotline dedicated to TIP. All right, so here's this New Yorker reporter, Sarah Sonnefield, who spent a year investigating this. Retired General Stanley McChrystal says that the unregulated rise of the Pentagon's Third World Logistics Army is undermining America's military objective. So you've got that issue. You've got uh, former S Congressman Christopher Shea saying it's a human rights abuse that cannot be tolerated. Um, there's references made that these workers, primarily from South Asia and Africa, often live in barbed wire compounds on U.S. bases, 
eat at meager chow halls and host dance parties featuring Nepalese romance ballads and Ugandan church songs, a large number employed by fly-by-night subcontractors who are financed, financed by the American taxpayer but who are often operating outside the law. Now this is not like it's not happening under our noses. That's what is most offensive to me. These are on bases in these countries. We know that moving forward in Iraq, State Department is going to be employing more of these third um, country nationals. So are we just going to compound this problem? Are we going to do something about it? I feel like our focus is on um, dotting I's and crossing T's and making sure that people have their passports or have been informed about uh, the uh, responsibilities to uh, inform, but we're not doing anything about the underlying problem, which is people are being enslaved, providing services, being told one thing, and yet being offered something very different. And we're allowing these subcontractors to continue to operate. A cure letter is a slap on the hand. They should be booted out of there. They should lose the, the privilege to work for the United States government forever. And we, we send them a cure letter, Mr. Howard? That's, that's the extent of the penalty that's going to be imposed on anyone but who these, is these again, trafficking? These, again, were for holding on to passports. And we give a cure letter, and if they don't abide by that, we would debar them and, and never do business with them again. Except that you did say that you believe there's a problem. And your response so far has been to send out cure letters. No, it's, it's also working on a daily basis to ensure that that the problems don't occur in our areas of responsibility. My time's expired. Are you? Can let me tell you a quick story, and we're going to go a different round. If you'll like, if you'll have additional questions as well. Part of my own preparation and uh, my own research on this, I sat down with an MP coming back from Afghanistan who handles internal security <clears throat> for one of the bases, and I'm going to leave their name out of it. When I asked about the questions of third country nationals on that base in Afghanistan right now, there was a long hesitation, and the response was, what would you like to know? <clears throat> we started talking about uh, human trafficking, trafficking in persons. Their response was, I don't even know where to report it, but I know it's going on. This is an MP doing internal security on one of our base. When I asked about living conditions, their response was, we would never, ever want to live where they live on base. Never. <clears throat> they said that they had um, some of the companies that they work for, they could, um, would lose their position and would immediately be kicked out which terrifies them because they have this massive loan back home they've got to pay for. They've got to stay and keep that job. If they don't stay and keep that job, they'll never be able to pay off the loan. So they're terrified they're going to lose it at any point. If they inter ever interact with Americans in any way that their boss considers in any way questionable that they're pushing towards that, they're just kicked out, which obviously they've now lost everything and have no chance of even gaining back what they paid into the system. Uh, could identify, this MP could identify the areas where prostitution was happening and sex trafficking. This is the reality that's on the ground right now. And my frustration is we know it. We've got to find some way to stop this. A zero tolerance policy is not working. Failing to prosecute is not working. Cure letters are not working not doing debarments and suspensions of contractors, that's not working. What, what needs to be done? And I think Ms. Spears' question is a great question. What tool do you need in your toolbox to make sure that this stops happening, this violates everything in the American value, that we value the individual person as a person created in God's image and has inalienable rights, no matter what country they are from, that they are to be honored as an individual in the middle of all that, and to know that our State Department, which stands up for human rights around the world, has indentured servitude happening in our embassies is deplorable to me. This is the group that is standing up for American values worldwide. 
Yet when these individuals return back to their home countries, all they can speak of is, I worked for a year for nothing and lived in these deplorable conditions. This violates everything about who we are and what we do. And the challenge is we have to have back to this committee some suggestions that extend beyond posting something in the cafeteria or a hotline to call into, some way that we shift from we have talked about this, we put policies in place, to we suspend, debar, to where contractors understand completely this is not acceptable some path of documentation that begins in their home country that if they don't come in with documentation saying how much they paid as a recruiter fee and it is verified that it is a legal amount to pay as a recruiter fee in that. Some kind of pathway that I understand keeping their passports a big deal, but if they have a passport and no way to get home or they have it such a large debt uh, that they can't leave for fear they will never be able to catch up on it and pay it off, that, that doesn't matter. Their passport is meaningless to them at that point because it would be the worst thing for them to go home because now it is even worse. They have got to go home and face the loan shark with no money. All these dynamics all wrap in the middle of this for us, and I am sure it does for you as well. This can't just be an issue that is only passionate for us. Obviously, you live and breathe in this all the time. But at some point, we have to move from the contracts in, uh, that we put out to primes and subprimes and all these contractors that are out there has the right language into it. That is a good start. But just checking to see if they have the right language is only the beginning point. The real issue is, do we have trafficking in persons that we are paying for over Federal tax dollars? or that we are turning a blind eye to. That is the ending destination on this. Now, I, I want to just throw it open for just a quick moment, and then I will go to Mr. Connolly uh, for a comment on that is. What, what response do you have at this point? What, what do you see is going to begin to make the shift? What, what will help us turn around? Any, any suggestion that you have that you would say, this is what we are looking at, I think it will turn the corner on this? Uh, Chairman, uh, I am not sure I have a definitive answer. I think I have got plenty of questions I have written down here that obviously we need to examine more carefully uh, in our own inspection work. Uh, the, the judicial side is, uh, frankly, a, a bureaucratic uh, set of hurdles that I don't presume to understand. Uh, I would. Uh, but the suspension of the debarment is a very low no, no, threshold. But suspension and debarment of prime contractors is certainly something uh, accessible to contracting officers and uh, commands in the field. And um, I don't have a good answer yet. I'm going to get one on why we haven't uh, been more proactive in using it. Can you give me a time when you're going to get that answer? Well, we have. We'd like to have a copy of that answer as well. Sure, I, I can. Well, uh, we have a report that we are working on right now that is due to you in January, two reports, and one of them is a broader perspective look at issues across DOD, and that would be the obvious place to make sure we have done sufficient research and can address this. The, the other issue, as you know, is the subcontractor issue, which uh, is beyond the, uh, the contracting purview of contracting officers, and that is a, an extreme vulnerability, needless to say. But if a subcontractor violates the rules, we can hold the prime accountable for it. That is correct. And, but uh, we are not currently holding uh, the prime accountable. Not for to it. the best of my knowledge and uh, not to the best of our oversight work yet. And uh, I also I don't have a good answer why that is not being used more aggressively. Okay. Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It seems to me that. Um, Maybe we have some legislative refinements required for this topic, but frankly, it has to do with will and moral outrage. Maybe if more of us thought of it as our sister or our daughter, there might be some reflection of moral outrage in the practice. And then maybe we would be motivated to make sure we are enforcing our own laws, regulations, memos, executive orders, and the like. It is not okay to turn a blind eye to this practice. It is not okay to treat it as a bureaucratic requirement that we can check off a box because people have been trained or made more aware. The object here is to cease the practice. It is a violation, not only of human rights, but of everything America stands for. We fought a civil war to end this kind of practice. 
and yet we're turning a blind eye to subcontractors serving our government who are in fact engaged in involuntary servitude and in some cases sexual trafficking. And we know what the problem is. And I'm deeply disturbed that we don't seem to be seized with a mission here. And until and unless we are, we're never going to solve the problem. All the laws and all the executive orders in the world aren't going to solve the problem. Mr. Howard, I was intrigued by your Bill of Rights. It sounds like a substantive contribution to helping us resolve a very complex problem. When was that uh, Bill of Rights promulgated? Uh, it was developed in 2008 and started to apply to our third country internationals in March, April of 2009. Okay. And how do we enforce it? We have uh, monthly checks where the managers on ground have to validate to us that uh, all points of the, the, the Bill of Rights are being adhered to for our associates. Our managers? Our associates, yes. Gotcha. So, and that extends to subcontractors? We hold the contractor liable for the subcontractor. So we, we check all of the third country nationals on a monthly basis. You heard the testimony of the first panel and the dialogue we had that, and let's assume, obviously inadvertently, but the system of incentives and disincentives actually works against us in the enforcement against human trafficking because all of the uh, disincentives encourage a prime subcontractor, frankly, not to report because he or she is at risk if they do. Right. What, how can we fix that so that we are actually rewarding people who ferret it out and report it so that we can deal with it? I am not sure how you can reward the subcontractors. I do know. No, no, the prime. The prime. prime. Uh, I would have to take that back and think of how we would reward them. Uh, I, I do know that our associates, the APHIS employees, uh, United States citizens, uh, continue to watch out for this and they will let our, our we have a hotline for the, the exchange and they will let the Inspector General for APHIS know if, if they see any violations at all. My colleague uh, referenced the New Yorker story. It documented the, the abuses of uh, several beauticians from Fiji. Yes who were falsely lured uh, by recruiters back home, uh, over whom apparently we have no jurisdiction or even interest, but uh, ostensibly to go work in a hotel in Dubai, but in fact they ended up working for subcontractors serving the U.S. government in Iraq. Is that correct? Uh, yes, my recollection from reading the article. They worked 12 hour days, seven days a week. Um, their passports were in fact held for some period of time presumably against their will, and the, um, their wages, uh, whatever they were promised, which was substantially more than what, in fact, they received, according to this article, uh, were only $350 a month. Uh, to your knowledge, is that accurate? It is accurate, in fact, that uh, the contract said 350 plus tips, and uh, when our Inspector General reviewed it, the tips amounted to about $450, which took the pay on a monthly basis up to about $800. Did APHIS ever interview these women? We attempted to, but they had already gone back to Fiji and we could not interview them. But we did interview additional associates at that, that site. And did you corroborate what you understood to be their, their story? Yes. Oh, and well, no. The, what we found is that the, the beauticians that were working there uh, said they all had their passports, that they enjoyed working for there, and they had uh, a few questions about their pay, but, but uh, nothing about uh, holding on to the passports or any sexual uh, activity. So you have reason, therefore, to doubt the, uh, the narrative of the New Yorker uh, with respect to these two women? All I can do is based on what our Inspector General did, did find during their research. You, you indicate that your, your uh, writ is limited in terms of sort of third countries where, from, from which these people are being recruited. But I thought in your opening testimony, I thought I heard you say you have a presence in something like 30 countries? We are in 30 countries. 30 countries. But you are not in, for example, Fiji or Nepal or places like that? No, this is where the main manpower agencies go out and uh, uh, recruit. Employees. Would you 
would you agree, in light of the concerns we have about human trafficking, that figuring out some methodology, whether it's with APHIS or IG offices or maybe Ms. Dixon's office, if we can get past two people staffing it, um, we ought to be addressing the, the, the place where people are recruiting, because that is, that is really the weak link in the chain, as Mr. McMahon indicated in the first panel. Based on what I heard today, yes, the, the root cause is right at the beginning. All right. I, I would certainly, and I know the Chairman and this members of the committee would welcome any additional thoughts you might have as you think about that in terms of how we might get at that, because I think if we don't get at that, we are never going to solve this problem. Uh, there are several, several uh, links in the chain we have to get at, but that is certainly one of them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. With that, let me make one quick request. I am going to ask Ms. Spears if you would like an additional round of questions. Could the four of you independently put together a set of ideas of how to be able to resolve this that we could have by February 1? That would give you three months to be able to pull together ideas of how we move past what we have in place to hear our solutions to fix this so that a year from now we don't have a hearing like this other than to say, well done, and I'd be able to move past that. Is that acceptable? Okay, by February 1 on that. With that, Ms. Spear, recognize you for six minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And thank you for giving the direction you just did. One of my biggest um, concerns about the hearings that we have here is that we show great outrage, the hearing's over, and business as usual. And it's also a problem in the issue of military rape in this country, where we have had 16 years and 18 hearings, and nothing has changed. And I fear that we will be in a similar situation in this arena as well if we don't stay on it. And I compliment you on making this request. I also would encourage you to have subsequent hearings. Uh, if we don't stay on this issue, it will continue without um, being addressed appropriately. I, I guess I would just like to understand, to you, Mr. Howard, when the Inspector General went and, and the beauticians had left, there still was a company, a subcontractor that had hired them, correct? Correct. And what happened to the subcontractor? Uh, due to the fact we could not validate the accusations, nothing. Nothing. Did you show the subcontractor this article and say, what is your response to this? I can't specifically say what the IG did and didn't say. I could get back to the, the committee on this. All right. I think, I think, as you can tell, we are vitally interested in this issue. I, we expect that you are going to put, you know, um, metal to the pedal, or <laughs> is that, yes. that the right terminology? Pedal to the metal. Pedal to the metal. Um, and and take this on as if it was your own family member. I think that was a, a reference that uh, my, my colleague had, had referenced. Because this is not just incompatible, I think that was the word Ms. Dixon used. This is offensive and violates every principle in our Constitution, every principle. And it is only going to get worse because our use of third-party nationals is increasing as we wind down in both Iraq and Afghanistan. So if we don't get this right, the problems are just going to uh, explode in my, in my view. So, um, Mr. Chairman, I, I think at, at this point I will just yield back. I do appreciate you being here today. As I mentioned before, I am sure this wasn't a fun day. It is not a fun day for us as well. Some of this was birthed out of a uh, prior hearing where the Commission on Overseas Contingencies came and submitted their report. Small aspect of that report, which is not relevant to what they are doing, highlighted that this is an ongoing problem. There will be more that will follow up from this as well, and both your testimony and the previous panel as well. The prime issue is now if we have a contract in place <laughs> and we know what the cost of the contract should be based on the travel, the people coming, the cost of the labor, the cost of housing, 
either these primes and subs are skimming off dollars and taking that dollar that is to be committed to workers, or they are working on an additional kickback, which is also illegal, uh, from the recruiter on the field uh, getting a cut uh, back to the, the uh, contractors, or we are violating the basics of, of what is a legal recruiter fee in the country. Uh, it is just on and on and on. But they are all things that are discoverable. At this point, it is moving from we have great rules and regulations to we are enforcing them and we are accomplishing that. We are going and asking the questions that we are afraid to ask, knowing what the answer might be. My concern is, and it is only my suspicion and concern, my concern is, is that we are not reporting it, we are not pushing it, we are not following through on this for fear that it gets out into the media and it becomes, it is easier to say we have had no prosecutions, assuming that means it is not occurring rather than we have had 25 prosecutions because it is occurring. I think it is out. It is occurring, has been occurring. It has been addressed for the past 20 years, just a piece at a time. Now we have got to move it from it is being addressed to right policies, win contracts and right language. Those are all good first steps to it is completely eradicated from what we do. That is what we are looking forward to being in the final step. I appreciate your time and the effort you put into this. I look forward to getting a chance to read back the ideas that you are submitting back to us by February 1. And with that, we are adjourned.